Thank you very much for that kind and generous introduction. And thanks to the center for the invitation. In African ways, self-introduction is a dominant tradition. Allow me to introduce myself in our African way. I'm George Gumisiriza, which is actually Gumisiriza George Awoli, son of Tinkasimire, who lives in Port Porto City, Kabrode in Western Uganda, grandson of Kaliegira, deceased, great grandson of Kivira, deceased, great great grandson of Buteki. All buried ancestral burial grounds at the foot of Mount Renzori in Kazingo, Western Uganda. Familiar people would remember Mount Renzori as the Mountains of the Moon, named by Sir Samuel Baker, Sir Henry Morton Stanley among other European explorers in Africa in the 1800s. I am a Matoro, and my ancestors came from the North. Here in the UK, I live in Bath, in Somerset, Southwest England. I appear before you in an African traditional wear called a kanzu handmade, all its features and elegance. It's a symbol of my heritage and the presence of my ancestors at this symposium. I have carried a piece of back cloth, which I'll talk about now in a minute as the Welsh will say. <laughs> I come in peace to draw Afrocentric death ways and perspectives from the margins to the center of the mainstream academia here in Cambridge and beyond. And the topic is repatriation scapes, personhood, power and otherness of migrant causes. You're all welcome to this lecture. Exposition through an African way of introduction. An African self-introduction structure is tacit knowledge among familiar people of African background within politics of identity, belonging, and heritage. The knowledge is ceremonially handed down by word of mouth, grounded in cultural memory and performativity. In theory, we can think about John Mbiti and Kwasi Weredu, among others, on African philosophy and thought. Also, Clifford Gatt, you would remember thick description, interpretation of cultures. My long African self-introduction blends the living and the dead through ideas of personhood and interconnectivity. As an African, I exist in our collective and in our collective exists my individual self within the African thought or practice. My introduction stipulates materials, place, scapes, including my ancestry, 
and genealogy. Also, the manner and purpose of accepting the invite to give this keynote. All these combined socially construct the idea of my heritage, including my current migration trajectory. My introduction emphasizes Africanness, relationality, as well as coloniality. Therefore, it is personhood to identity, to belonging, to heritage within peculiar conforming forms of power. I argue that an African way of traditional self-introduction consolidates African notions of heritage scapes, to borrow Georgia Ashworthy's term. We shall explore these terms in the course. I was talking about my village. This is my village, and that is Mount Renzori, commonly known as the Mountains of the Moon. It's so famous for its snow capes here. And of course, climate change has affected all that. Background. In this paper, the notion of power in death politics may appear to regionalize perspectives on death through the corpse. However, the notion of personhood liberalizes heritage through the diverse meanings of identity, home, and belonging. Therefore, heritage matters remain complex and the initiative to question ethical considerations is justifiable. Presently in the West, the UK and the US, the focus on in death scholarship is about seeking innovations towards dying well and alternative methods of body disposal. However, knowledge on African death perspectives remains marginalized in the main academic spaces. Recent popular global politics has persistently questioned people on the move as victims or criminals. Political voices in the UK have claimed forms of invasion and marauding Africans in the context of migration. The negative attitude implies that living people on the move are unworthy of recognition. How about the dead? We have seen dissociation because of the identity of the deceased, the cause of death, and the circumstances. As a result, this undermines the personhood by alienating both the living and the dead. Considerably, the ontological attitude attached to the theme of this symposium draws on cultural memory, but also contemporary practices. I'm optimistic that the conversation will challenge us to think about our shared values of personhood to address persistent trends of power and knowledge production. My ongoing PhD research pursues similar aspirations. Session guide questions. I have called them guide questions because I know or I reckon that each of us here as I speak has got some questions. Please add them to this list because I've only got three. Number one, how does personhood of the living characterize migrant corpses? Number two, how are global institutional policies and practice prejudiced in framing 
dead bodies of migrants. Three, how does repatriation scapes expose the margins in death politics ignored in academia? We shall talk about human remains and corpses, including those of people on the move found in border spaces. Some images sourced from public domain may be difficult for some people to watch. Some terminology will be used interchangeably. Migrants, refugees, people on the move. Please don't ask me what the difference is. <laughs> What is repatriation scapes? Repatriation scapes is a framework for exploring death and the process of repatriation of the deceased. The term encompasses the physical space and emotional aspects within the social, cultural, and religious funeral rituals and practices. The framework follows Anno Genep's notion of the rites of passage. Personhood in repatriation scapes explores language, materiality, and relationality. I argue that personhood is a thread that links human remains matters between the living and the dead towards cultural heritage in African death ways. However, what does it look like elsewhere? It may be difficult to consider some forms of heritage when relational personhood narratives are broken or ignored. Forensic humanitarian conceptual framework. The forensic humanitarian framework draws on human rights of the bereaved to conceptualize concerns for the dead. The process ensures robust ethical considerations for all parties involved while centering the unidentified deceased person. There in the middle. So this is what I'm talking about. But in the center, we've got the unidentified deceased person. And since the circumstances in which this person has died and every other factor involved together, they will construct the idea of social death. But also we can see the pillars under which it is lying. Practices involving impartiality, posthumous dignity and respect for the, the bereaved consolidate initiatives towards a wider discourse on diverse forms of heritage. However, unlike repatriation scapes framework, humanitarian approaches may not articulate the rituals and traditions. These are crucial for relational personhood of the survivors regarding the transcendence of the dead within the traditional funerary rites of passage. And of course, repatriation scapes framework is work in progress because that is my framework. Methodological considerations towards a multidisciplinary practical prism. In this paper, I argue that repatriation, frame, uh, repatriation scapes framework alongside humanitarian approach framework will provide us with a multidisciplinary practical prism to explore the following issues. A, to understand some issues on, of heritage through the stages of the rites of passage, particularly of deceased migrants. The lens of death is generalizable, but rituals and traditions are diverse in society. B, to optimize ethical considerations regarding the lens of migrant corpses in contested spaces. There is potential for generalizable strands of practice towards 
posthumous dignity of the deceased among some societies. However, it is important to acknowledge that even though the system of repatriation of migrant bodies was streamlined, there might be some deceased who completely lost home or it's not safe to return a corpse. How about individual choice to return or not to return? This demands robust ethical considerations to embrace the migrant corpse through a holistic attention as a project of humanitarian concern. Paradigmatic space or situating knowledge. Chilisa Bagere advocates for a paradigmatic space of knowledge to allow, in this case, Afrocentric perspectives on death to interact with Western or Eurocentric approaches to knowledge. Anthropologist Maya Green makes a similar observation in this area of situating knowledge. Green argues that, quote, situating knowledge is an active process, end quote. Both Bagley and Green suggest engaging with academic knowledge in a progressive manner within appropriate perspectives to accommodate continuity and change. I find this argument attractive to this symposium. However, I recommend that issues in this paper should be understood through an academic disciplinary prism to minimize the impact of regionalization of knowledge. Rights for the dead, global institutional practices on migrant corpses appear inclined towards how human rights do not apply to corpses because A, corpses cannot claim their rights. B, corpses cannot carry out duties for other corpses or survivors. Categorically, forensic humanitarian approaches relating to social death pursue practical schemes into restoring a perceivable image of dignity of the human corpse. Supposedly, within the relative understanding of the relevance of funeral rituals, tradition, identity, and belonging. Sociologist Claire Moon reiterates three human rights that contextually apply to, acts, to, to cases involving migrant corpses. The right to identification, the right to return to families, the right to proper burials. These rights underpin how forensic humanitarian approaches may apply to the repatriation scapes of migrant corpses. Moon suggests that dignity is an overarching theme that blends life and death through multidisciplinary interpretations of personhood. Historian Anton de Beats, hope I got the name right, claims that the living all the dead duties in three diverse ways. Duties of the living to the dead. One, partly passive or negative, partly active or positive, many favoring abstention, others favoring intervention. Two, wholly moral and partly legal. In general, the more remote the dead, the more duties are moral. And three, universal, not specific. Similar to Claire Moon, Beats clarifies that, quote, duties are performed because most people believe that the dead possess posthumous dignity and therefore deserve respect and protection, end quote. This implies that ignoring migrant corpse interpretation can undermine 
dignity as a core human rights principle for the living shared with the dead in paradigmatic spaces of their heritage. Repatriation scapes explores how the living might be obligated to serve the dead from diverse backgrounds focusing on migrant corpses. Personhood, open-ended perspectives. African deathways underscore personhood through posthumous dignity and recognition. Relatedly, scholars have advanced ideas of the living dead, the undead, socially alive, uh, but politically dead in different studies. These ideas propose open-ended perspectives of personhood. Africans train their kin through language inclusive of personhood as individuals in the collective. This tradition, traditional mode of instruction may be less accessible to outsiders as a day-to-day -day norm among Africans. The living continually restore the personhood of the deceased through posthumous dignity and recognition. Fernberg Joe deposits that, quote, a newly dead body is a sacred symbol of a real person, end quote. This perspective highlights how bodies are perceived and handled across different settings. Elsewhere, literature suggests that human remains and materials through ritual and tradition can regenerate memories for recognition of the deceased. The recent repatriation of the tooth of murdered Congolese prime minister, Patrice Lumumba, reportedly brought peace to all actors in the interest of the deceased. His tooth is the only remains after his body perished in acid. Lumumba's tooth symbolizes all his identities. Reports suggest that Lumumba's relations sought the restoration of his posthumous dignity within his heritage six decades after his death and liminality. Lumumba's tooth was returned to his family in June 2022 following the Belgian court ruling. According to reports, Lumumba's tooth has been kept in a special museum. However, in relation to the theme of this symposium, encountering human remains, we can think about the parallels between the presence of the military at Lumumba's death and the military power at the return of his tooth. We can think about power dynamics and the current custody of Lumumba's tooth. In my view, cultural heritage appears encapsulated in Catherine Vadri's political lives of dead bodies. Two years dead. It's next door. Popular media reported that. In 2019, British-born medical secretary, Sheila Sulwan, 61, died in her flat in Peckham, South London. Sulwan's corpse was found in February, 2022, two years after her death. Sulwan's brother wanted a private funeral. Only two people attended Sulwan's funeral at Croydon Crematorium. This included Siluan's estranged brother and a representative from Siluan's landlord. Siluan's sister in South Africa, who she, has ne she had never met, received the corpse in East Cape, South Africa. Over 100 mourners attended the funeral. Siluan was buried at her ancestral burial grounds in South Africa.
questions and reflections on Suruan's death in South Africa and the UK, and probably our own individual questions about this case and coming here. Siluan's sister affirms the compelling sense of community in South Africa grounded in African thought, Ubuntu, which is personhood. To the contrary, in the UK, residents on the block are taking action at the housing ombudsman for letting them live next to a corpse. The corpse becomes social capital for residents to articulate their, concern, their concerns regarding the standards of living. Sluan's corpse symbolizes death politics in the UK regarding materiality, probably less about relationality to the deceased. However, the collective in South Africa claimed Sluan's corpse within broader perspectives of cultural heritage. Arguably, the difference between the scapes lies in how power shapes the terrain. Sorry. Arguably, the difference between the scapes lies in how power shapes the terrain. For British-born Sheila Suwan, Britain was home, but with no heritage. However, South Africa to Suluan, where she had no dwelling, but contained her heritage. Contextualizing power and otherness and othering of migrant corpses. Concerning people on the move, studies reveal lack of close handling in recording, media reporting, and absence of repatriation of corpses. According to Conley et al. 2017, there is no accessible standard procedure of handling migrant corpses or remains. Migrant bodies are often buried without formal identification or tradition. Institutions do not consider repatriation among options. Research has described the regulations of repatriating migrant remains in border contested areas as, quote, ill-defined. The study concludes that lack of political will and excessive costs are some of the reasons for failure to repatriate migrant corpses. The research findings were particular to the Mediterranean deaths before 2015. Anecdotal reports suggest that authority fear to identify the dead to assume responsibility and recognition of various crimes. Therefore, migrant corpses are portrayed as, quote, objects of horror and dread end quote, a phrase coined by Haas in 1960. Here is the question. Is the ambiguity surrounding migrant corpses a means of controlling the living through social stigma? We can think about two examples of cases involving migrant corpses trapped in space and place under migrant circumstances. On the edge case, the Essex lorry deaths in October, 2018. I'm sure some of us would remember this case. 39 people of Vietnamese origin were found dead in the back of a refrigerated lorry in Essex, UK. Bereaved families declined ashes after cremation in favor of all bodies on grounds of Vietnamese culture and funeral rich death rituals. 
No financial support was offered to repatriate the corpses. The Vietnamese government offered loans to families in grief to meet repatriation costs. The UK Home Office could not assimilate the repatriation of corpses to the familiar deportation of living migrants to their countries of origin. Crowdfunding raised 84,850 pounds towards body repatriation costs. Example two. The impeded corpse repatriation and grave eviction in Sicily, Italy. According to media reports, some Eritrean refugees from Sweden and Switzerland traveled to ritualize their relatives and discovered empty graves. The Lampedusa shipwreck migrants, migrant remains had been evicted from their graves and buried in a mass grave. Bodies buried in 27, were buried in 2017 in a cemetery in Siaka, Sicily, Italy. Media reports claim that authority in Siaka denied any knowledge when confronted and ordered an internal investigation. When I talk of ritualizing, this is a story where a man called Ipsby was on his boat with his wife and the boat capsized and the wife died and she was buried somewhere. The whole story reveals that it was very difficult. He was moved away, left the body in the hands of the police and the body was buried somewhere. But coming back to find the wife so that he could ritualize, this is what he's doing. He's trying to say, this woman had a name. She had been buried without being identified. But fortunately, pictures of the body had been taken and where the body was, there was a number somewhere and the man recognizes, um, he, he managed just to recognize his wife among the many pictures from the dreadlocks or the way the, the hair had been plated. And that's how he comes to this. But the rest who would have come to the same cemetery found the remains had been evicted. Rights of exclusion. The negative attitude and practice towards migrant uh, corpses in the above cases equates to Chidesta's rights of exclusion. In this sense, power structures across borders alienate the migrant corpse through policy and regulation. David Chidesta, following Robert Paz, elaborates how the rituals of exclusion apply to people of despised social status or those perceived to defy the expectations of a particular society. Chidesta further elaborates how rights of exclusion regarding death rituals are important in establishing a desired effect in a community. Thomas Leaker, in his book, The Work of the Dead, describes the disposal of a corpse away from the norm as, quote, an attack on the order and meaning the living believe the dead uphold for them, end quote. Lika attaches the handling of the dead to cultural representation and belonging. We can see that global trends where migrants, dead or alive, are ambiguously defined as criminals or victims, corpses are more likely to reinforce the dominant image of a community or state, defining it by what it excludes. Ethical considerations, dilemma in repatriation scapes. Focusing on posthumous dignity, 
repatriation escapes aims to maintain the cultural value attached to a corpse through mass dimensional practical prism. However, moving scapes imp implies potential shift in understanding traditions within conforming death ways. Corpses in transit are classified as cargo or goods, which may not require intimate governance offered in funeral spaces. Corpses framed as baggage are literally misunderstood from cultural perspectives. Alison Rento reports on Anyanousi and Panaim case, an Igbo man from Nigeria sued an American airline Panaim for mishandling his mother's corpse. Olama Anyewusi died in 1986. The airline was paid to fly the body from New York to Port Harcourt, Nigeria, via Paris over two days. However, the journey was delayed for nine days. And this being Africa, people would have gathered at the house of the Igbo man. They were waiting for this elder, an opinion leader, a counselor, the custodian of wisdom and culture to return. They were there waiting. But what happened? There had been a mix up in corpses. A stranger's body was de delivered to Port Harcourt. Lastly, when Anyewusi's body arrived, the coffin was in a ballop sack. This material. The corpse was face down, which meant to the Igbo that the death occurred under the shortest circumstances. The court ruled in favor of Panem on the basis that corpses in transit are handled as goods or cargo. Repatriation scapes research reveals that a body in transit retains the personhood among the bereaved. Quote, send our son or daughter back, end quote, is a common phrase applied to corpses during negotiations the negotiations to repatriate the body, negotiations to collect the money, negotiations to run through the, the bureaucracy. So this is what we're talking about. People the other side will be saying, send our daughter back, send our child back, send our son back, never send the corpse back. So this is what we're talking about here. And I have called that corpse personhood in my research. However, does the expression propose that the dead have rights? African appellants involve courts of law to appeal ethical consideration towards social justice. The tradition in this case seeks to highlight the problems associated with framing the corpses as goods, particularly neglecting intimate governance. Funeral directors in my research and indeed courts of law understand body repatriation as business. However, African appellants argue that ethical considerations should apply a practical prism of tradition to reflect Africanness of both the body and the survivors on grounds of culture and heritage. The humanitarian action framework draws on human rights power to apply such a prism in practical terms. Funeral rituals and traditions. Migrant Hirais for the NATO land. Hirais is a Welsh term that is difficult to translate in English, but it refers to longing homesickness for a place that no longer exists 
all never was. And the word is heroes. Literature suggests that body repatriation is popular among first generation migrants. It is about the interconnectivity, relationships, and value often attached to land. Traditions such as washing the dead of Ziraga and shrouding of Zinga in a back cloth or Ugo among Buganda and the Buganda in Uganda are important for proper ritual regarding liminal rights. The Ugandan backcloth is similar to Madagascar's Merina Lambamena used to shroud the corpse. That's the, the Merina Lambamena. Common to both cultures, shrouding materials are contributed by family, friends, and in-laws. Mourners contribute small amounts of money towards funeral expenses or condolences called Amavugo in Uganda language. The marina called the money the fringes of the Lambamena. The fund is explicit obligation focused on connectivity, kinship, and heritage. Modern trends of mobile money and remittances facilitate African diaspora to get involved away from, well away from the ancestral land. Conclusion. This paper focused on Afro-African notions of heritage and African death ways. We have looked at how we can understand our shared personhood through repatriation scapes. The lens of migrant human remains in border areas are provi have, pro have provided or has provided some insights on how power shapes global perspectives in death politics. We have been challenged to continue thinking about how power perpetuates heritage and certainties, thereby demanding robust ethical considerations. I have proposed a multidisciplinary practical prism for dealing with human remains, relationality, materiality, and language are key aspects that are more likely to embrace all actors in death politics.